Welcome to the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee's 33rd meeting of 2019. Before we move to our first item on the agenda, can I remind everyone to either switch off their mobile phones or put them on silent as they may affect the broadcasting system. The first item on our agenda today is to hear evidence at stage one in the relation to the Animals and Wildlife Penalties, Protection and Powers Scotland Bill. The first panel of two panels today focuses on the legislative framework in the bill and I'm delighted to welcome Mark Radford, uh, reader at the University of Aberdeen, Gillian Maudsley, the Secretary of the Criminal Law Committee of the Law Society of Scotland and Scott Blair, the advocate, uh, advocate for uh, Centre of Animal Law. Um, good morning to you all and thank you for coming in. Um, I'd like to kick off with some questions around um, the, inc increase, the, the proposed increase in maximum sentences um, for animal welfare offences. Could you um, outline the, the evidence base and the rationale for the proposed increases in uh, the penalties in the bill, including current trends for the specified offences and the rationale for spe specific maximum penalties, if you could? Well, the, the rationale is that the maximum penalty is not appropriate for the most serious offences. It's as simple as that. Um, the number of cases that would be involved will be relatively small, but they are the most serious. And in particular, offences where there are either a large number of animals involved or the, uh, the, the unnecessary suffering has been caused uh, for money or for pleasure. Uh, there's long been an argument that those are more serious offences and the current maximum is inappropriate. Okay. Finlay? Um, the, the, I just wonder whether you think the, the, the scope of the bill uh, goes far enough. Um, we're, we're looking at the maximum pen penalties increased for, for some uh, animal cruelty uh, issues, but uh, Section 20 on mutilation, 21 on cruel operations, 22 in poisons, 24 in enduring welfare. Uh, these aren't going to be subject to an increase in the maximum fine or jail sentences, but could lead to, to serious animal welfare issues. Why are these not included in the new legislation? Those are old offences. They, they, they pre-exist the 2006 Act. In fact, they, um, most of them go back to the Protection of Animals Scotland Act uh, 90, uh, 1912. Um, so they're pre-existing offences. Very, very few, um, with the possible exception of poison, the poison offence, very few of those are brought. And in, most, in, in all of those cases, they could also be covered by either the welfare or unnecessary suffering offence. OK, thank you for that. Also, also within the scope of the bill, um, it, I'm going to ask you about what's excluded. So we have uh, licensing of uh, animal breeding, pet sales, sanctuaries. Um, we've got a, a bill currently uh, in consultation for uh, sheep worrying and whatever. Wouldn't it be better to have one piece of legislation which covered all these rather than a tackling every little uh, piece of uh, legislation that might, might lead in the long term to animal welfare issues? Well, the 2006 Act is an umbrella piece of legislation and uh, relates to all what are called protected animals, that is um, a vertebrate other than man and has to meet one of three conditions. Either it's of a kind commonly domesticated in the British Islands, or it's under the control, temporary or permanently, of man, or it is not living in a wild state. So that is an umbrella piece of legislation. The issue of licensing, the Scottish Government is in the, has had a consultation on bringing in new legislation on the licensing regime. England did last year. And... Um, and, uh, the licensing regime is, if you like, an administrative regulatory regime. Um, there will be nothing preventing somebody who's in breach of any new licensing uh, regulations to also be uh, 
um, prosecuted for a welfare offence or an unnecessary suffering offence under the 2006 Act. So it's complementary rather than in opposition to one another. Okay. Um, I, I wondered whether we could be pointed at any academic research on a particular issue that touches on this. Um, sentences clearly are about penalising the guilty. Uh, and to some extent, I suppose, it's a fine compensating the criminal justice system for the cost of prosecuting. But also, it is said, um, they constitute deterrence. And I just wonder uh, whether there is academic research that shows us the balance in the criminal's mind between the deterrence that comes from the thought they might get caught and the deterrence that comes from the punishment that follows being convicted. Because I think... It is one of the debates more generally, but since we're talking about increasing sentences here, I think it's appropriate to, uh, to seek whether there's uh, some clarity from academic research. There's no academic research from uh, the UK, which I can point you to, but I think it's important to understand that when it comes to particularly unnecessary suffering, what used to be called cruelty, the vast majority of prosecutions are brought for neg arise from negligence. In other words, it's unintentional um, and it's essentially people not looking after their animals properly. And the, the degree of seriousness, clearly if there's a lot of animals involved it can be serious, but, but um, the degree of it's, it, those are offences of a completely different nature from those which arise out of deliberate cruelty or unnecessary suffering, unnecessary suffering arising from large numbers of animals being involved, or in particular, and the committee will be aware of, of, of the issue of puppy smuggling mm -hmm. and puppy farming, where people are making very significant amounts of money and clearly the penalty doesn't fit the crime and the potential uh, benefit that they're, they're making from it. I think also it's important to see, to see the way the piece of legislation works as a whole, um, because also in the 2006 Act are care notices, and those allow... The, the difference between welfare, the welfare offence and the unnecessary suffering offence is the latter only occurs after the animal has suffered. The welfare offence can be a protective um, provision in that it allows enforcement authorities to uh, intervene at an early stage to put the situ either get the animal out of the situation or put the situation right. And th those who are appointed under the Act can issue a care notice uh, which identifies the problem, tells the person how long they've got to put it right, and um, what they've got to do. And in Scotland, unlike England, um, a failure to comply with a care notice is an offence in itself. Now, what this legislation does is it makes the system more flexible at both ends. It increases the maximum sentences for the most serious offences, but at the other end, the, 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 the proposal to introduce fixed penalty notices would allow... Um, a prov would allow a sanction short of prosecution where there's a failure to comply with a care notice. I'm not, I'm not sure if it necessarily is quite the point that you're looking for, but taking the broader perspective and speaking from criminal law rather than specifically, obviously deterrence is a major factor and clearly an increase in sentencing will offer the judiciary greater powers, obviously, in what the sentence is. I think it's important always to think of deterrence as in um, the sentence that will be pronounced in any case that is successfully prosecuted, and to look at the factors that come into that. And I would only highlight, in respect of that, the importance of uh, sentencing being appropriate and commensurate in the overall criminal scheme, but in particular any case that is um, sentenced is about uh, tariff, setting an appropriate tariff, and that tariff being known about, and that's part of education and training, and as much as part of the judiciary, and certainly that's where I see the role of something like the Scottish Sentencing Council, 
which were committed um, to doing sentencing guidelines. I think that's very important. We can see there are sentencing guidelines in England, and that, certainly from my experience, does a lot to educate um, the judiciary that may only deal with one of these cases from time to time to get the sentence right, to get it appropriate in line with other criminal, serious criminal offending. So I think when you're looking at deterrence, you need also to take a step back and look at it from the bigger criminal picture as to the other factors that the sentence should be appropriate, but that it also carries sufficient penalty for deterrence. And already, um, um, Mr. Radford's talked about uh, the question of, um, you know, money being made from it. Now, that clearly is a role for aspects such as proceeds of crime, and that's such an important deterrence because frequently from the experience that I've had, criminals aren't necessarily so concerned about the conviction affecting them and putting them possibly in prison. It's the impact on the family picture and the wider profitability and affluence that has come from criminalisation. So I think when you talk about deterrence, that may not be quite the answer, but I think these are the kind of factors that have to be looked at, um, as well as obviously the opportunity being there by a bill that increases sentence, so gives a range of options rather than restricts any judge to a summary sentence, etc. Scott Brown. Thank you very much, uh, convener. Can I just two brief comments uh, <coughs> relative to what's been said? In relation to the last point on uh, sentencing, one of the points that uh, ALAW made in its submission to uh, the committee was that that there appears to be a, a view, if, if not a, a basis in evidence, that uh, the prosecution and detection and conviction in relation to wildlife offences is particularly difficult, and that if the penalties are set at a relatively low level, then one gets into this somewhat circular situation of difficult to prosecute, difficult to investigate, penalties are not very high. So from the perspective of the prosecutor, not much incentive to go forward, but conversely for those who are committing these offences against wildlife, not much of a deterrent either. So with specific regard to wildlife offences, um, we certainly welcome a proposal to increase maximum sentences because that does seem to reflect the concern in relation to the difficulties that arise there. In relation to the issue of, I suppose, consolidating all of the animal legislation into one piece of statute, I can, as a practising lawyer, I can readily understand the, um, the attraction to that, of all your law in the one place. It makes it a lot easier to find it. I think the difficulty you have here, is, as uh, Mike Radford has said, is that the purposes of the various regimes we have are different. Some are criminal law regimes, some are protective welfare regimes. Uh, licensing, which is a particular interest of mine, uh, and I've certainly been involved recently in uh, some of the work on uh, the reform of dog breeding law and uh, puppy farming and Lucy's law, uh, and hopefully I'm fairly well versed in that area, is in itself a distinct area of law, of administrative law, um, that is more properly uh, something that a local authority should have control over in its area. And it would be difficult, I think, to have the one statute, or even a couple of statutes, covering all of these areas. Um, far better, I think, that they are seen as uh, different but complementary. One example that comes to mind from licensing law is that in relation to the current uh, Civic Government Act 1982, I'm sure members will be familiar with that uh, to some extent, which covers areas like taxi licensing and so on, a breach of the licensing provisions there is also a criminal offence and that can be prosecuted under criminal law. And it strikes me uh, that's a system that's worked well for years. And likewise, insofar as we are also looking at reforming our animal licensing law, a system whereby licensing offences are both civil matters for the licensing authority and criminal law matters for the fiscal is a model that is readily established and understandable. Beautiful. Uh, Mark, you wanted to come in? Um, yeah, I was, I was interested in that last point, actually, because the bill doesn't cover licensing, does it? It doesn't seek to extend sentences for licensing, but it does cover um, other areas. Um, but I just wanted to ask about animal sentience, because, um, again, this could have been something which the bill may have updated in terms of the definition of sentience. But do you have thoughts on that? And do you think the bill is the appropriate place to put that, or are there other ways to update that? 
view is that that requires separate legislation. Um, I, I was involved with giving evidence to the Environment, Food and Rural Affairs Committee um, what, a couple of years ago when DEFRA uh, produced their ill-fated sentience provision. Um, and I think it needs, it needs a separate uh, piece of legislation. What leaving aside quite what sentiency means, which animals it applies to, and so on and so forth, that provision, which I understand is, is still being, the, the issue is still alive so far as, as DEFRA is concerned, that provision would have made a significant difference in the sense that up until now, animal welfare uh, legislation has focused on those who are directly responsible for animals, whereas that provision in, would have imposed a duty on government. So it's a, it, it, and, and if we're going for, forward in that way, and hopefully we will, it is, a, it is a materially different sort of provision. Just to follow up on what Scott was saying about licensing, um, clearly there is the fall back to prosecute for failure um, and licensing provisions, but in practice, the vast majority um, of, of issues are dealt with administratively by changing license conditions, revoking licenses. And in a way, that's the point of a licensing system, that it can, it can be regulated and enforced administratively rather than through the criminal law. The, the, the answers you've given have been really useful, but it, it leads on to uh, or, or get some more info, or like some more information and other types of penalties. So you, you've talked about different methods, but in, in, in practice, how effective are the likes of community payback orders and disqualification uh, orders being carried out at the moment? And is the new legislation likely to tighten that up? Um, and what's your thoughts on uh, automatic bans? The moment we know you can be banned from from keeping animals, but there doesn't appear to be a lot of consistency when it comes to the courts handing out banning orders we like for keeping animals. Should it be automatic that uh, keeping animals, uh, you're banned from keeping animals if you're convicted of the most serious animal welfare uh, crimes? Um, I can pick up maybe the point about community payback orders. I mean, clean, clearly community payback orders are there and have been enforced for some time. I think they're particularly important when you perhaps look at the recent legislation and presumption against short sentences, because effectively, as you're familiar, that means that it's unlikely sentences would be under 12 months. The advantage of a community payback order is that some of these offences are such that you may well feel doing unpaid work in the community is a payback and it also is not a light sentence from the point of view of commitment on these people that may otherwise be working and have to fit in. So I think community payback orders, I'm not sure where they may have been imposed, but for appropriate sentences would actually be effective and clearly in line with the kind of policies that the government is promoting. With regard to autom automatic bans, again, that is something that can be appropriate. As, and I'll let my colleagues speak who would know more about when it'd be appropriate, but automatic bans as part of a sentencing regime could be very effective. My only reservation naturally is that it's always subject to the appropriate appeal mechanisms, etc. <coughs> They're clearly, excuse me, clearly laid out. But I think my two colleagues probably can comment more on the um, sanction of disqualification. But effectively taking away someone's livelihood does seem to me on occasion to be appropriate. I would certainly endorse the, the, the latter point, uh, members. It strikes me that when one immerses oneself in uh, the wealth of material to show just how cruel people can be towards vulnerable creatures, that uh, certainly in my mind, and I'm sure in members' minds, a real sense of repugnance arises. And I think certainly there is scope for having a system of automatic ban to reflect society's view that some things are simply beyond the pale. I think in particular the parallel I would draw is that um, it's not a very good parallel, but of course we have a system of protection of children in our country whereby the ultimate sanction on one view is your children are taken away from you and perhaps freed for adoption. Now that might be because of parenting skills, it might be because of cruelty, every case is different. But where we are dealing with plain cases of cruelty and intentional 
abusive animals or just disregard, reckless disregard for their interests, it's difficult, I think, to escape the view that uh, automatic bans uh, have no role to play and would, I think, be broadly supported by most members of society. Okay. Claudia. Uh, oh, ap apologies, <laughs> Mr. Radford. Thank you. Um, I think it's unfortunate that the issue of disqualification orders does not appear in the bill. Um, the title includes the word penalties, and clearly a disqualification order is a penalty. It is not, however, a punishment. Um, it is not to be confused with any other sanction which is imposed on, on, on um, a person. Uh, in, uh, imprisonment, fine, and the other uh, uh, sanctions which are available to the court are a punishment. Disqualification orders are intended to protect animals going forward. So, they, in my view, they are a penalty, not a punishment. This legislation covers penalties. It's unfortunate that there isn't anything here about disqualification orders. They predate the 2006 Act, but the 2006 Act gives a much greater range of available orders. Um, and so if we're, if we're talking about a compulsory disqualification order, we would need to know precisely which, uh, what, what was being disqualified. Um, the idea behind the 2006 Act was, was by including a lot more types or, or uh, variations on the disqualification order was that they, there would be more flexibility um, for them to fit whatever the offence had been. The problem is that a, a court has to already give reasons why it's not giving a disqualification order. Um, at the very least, with these uh, with the more serious offences, there should be a very strong presumption at the very least, if it's, not, if it's not compulsory, and the problem with compulsory orders is always the difficult case, that it could end up being disproportionate, uh, particularly if it affected somebody's livelihood. But there should be a very strong presumption that there will be a disqualification order, and the court should be un under a duty to give a reasoned, thorough opinion if it decides not to, and that should be appealable. There should also, it's also really important that there is a register of these orders. At the moment, uh, there is no collection, um, there is no collective view of orders, so we don't know who is getting them, and we cannot look at the consistency between different courts. It used to be said that people would know about disqualification orders because neighbours would know it would be reported in the local press because the local press was full of court cases. Um, populations are much more mobile now, so neighbours probably won't know, and there isn't a local press in the way that there used to be. So there simply isn't uh, an informed view of when they're being given, what is being given, who has them. Claudia. Thank you, convener. Um, could I just come back? I have got a, a substantive question, but could I come back to yourself, um, Mr. Radford, and just um, ask you, you said, uh, if I'm correct, that um, negligence was an unintentional issue. Now, in my layperson's perspective, if you, if you treat an animal in a negligent way, it would seem to me that um, you are an adult and you have responsibilities. And that I don't understand why the word unintentional came in when I've read a lot of the cases that have come forward very disturbingly um, in evidence. So could you just um, say briefly something more about that? Yeah, yes. Um, in the criminal law, there are strict liability offences, which yeah. is where, like parking, speeding, where uh, the person's state of mind at the time is irrelevant. More serious offences divide into two types, mm. um, either objective uh, uh, mental element, which is a reasonable person test, yes. or um, a subjective one, 
where it's the intention of the person, difference being manslaughter and murder. The, the conduct and the result is the same. The difference in the offence is the mental element. Now, around the world, a lot of uh, cruelty or unnecessary offences unnecessary suffering offences are restricted to where it can be shown beyond reasonable doubt that the person intended the animal to suffer. Mm -hmm. um, and clearly that's a high threshold. The vast majority of uh, prosecutions for unnecessary suffering don't arise from people intending. Um, they aren't looking after their animal properly and it generally its condition declines, deteriorates over a period of time. Um, and it may be out of ignorance. In many, many cases, it's not just the animal who is not look at, being looked after properly. Their lives are in some chaos, and in fact, they're not looking after themselves properly. Um, and it's probably not appropriate that such, such prison, that people should be sent to prison. Those offences are much less now because of the welfare offence. The problem prior to 2006 was an offence only arose after the animal had suffered. So it didn't actually protect yeah. the animal, yeah. it simply made the person accountable after the, after the event. The beauty of the welfare offence is that it allows for intervention, along with the care notices, it allows for intervention before the animal uh, is, it has reached the point of suffering. So, for example, if somebody is not feeding their, their dog properly, it will, its condition will deteriorate over a period of time. And if they don't take advice from enforcement authorities, now steps can be taken to get the, the, the animal away from that situation. That is a very, I would suggest to you that that's a very different situation from the person who is deliberately causing unnecessary yeah, suffering thank, because thank they get some helpful. sort of... I'm, I'm keenly conscious on, 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 on top of time, yes, but yes. I did ask the question. So, <laughs> um, uh, so um, my, my other question is, um, any comments from the panel? Um, not necessarily all of you, um, just in terms of time, but most welcome if you wish to comment. Um, the need for any further interventions to support appropriate penalties being applied or to support broader compliance with the law... Um, such as sentencing guidelines, enforcement and public awareness. And um, just tacked on the end of this very short question um, is um, ch changes to the powers of any agencies um, such as the SSPCA, if you have a view on that. Well, I would pick up maybe the first part and leave the, the change of powers. I think I would refer to the answer I gave earlier in respect that I think um, as all criminal, all changes to criminal sentencing... It's part of awareness um, uh, of the judiciary, um, of all the parties, both Crown Office and Defence, of what the likely sentence should be and pitching it within the criminal framework. So we're very reliant, uh, as you've discussed earlier, on the organisations and people that really understand animals making that known. But there is also the obligation of education of all these parties, which is part either of legal education or indeed, as I highlighted in our response to the Judicial Institute, I think there is a definite need for Scottish um, for sentencing guidelines, as I referred to earlier, um, for the reasons that that does really set out yeah. parameters. The judges do not need to obviously observe them, but it does set out very clear guidelines. So, on that respect, I think that's part of, if you like, our area of law that needs to the education and training and awareness, and that's partly about publicity for the cases that are successfully prosecuted. I think it's about education generally and more generally, uh, education of the children. It's part of perhaps just respecting animals and it's also um and that's where i think probably a number of the organizations that are interested in animal welfare have a role and particularly we all have a role once this legislation is passed in making people aware and ensuring that information is out there because there's no point in increasing penalties unless people are really aware that they're going to be applied when appropriate yeah. thank you yeah if i could just follow and the point that Gillian made there, which is very much a, a theme that uh, I know is close to ALOS uh, hearts, is that there's increasing international research to demonstrate links between cruelty towards humans and cruelty towards animals and how behaviours that are learned very early in life can carry through to uh, later life. And 
we can all probably remember our own school days and in the schoolyard, someone pulling the leg off spiders and things like that going on, which you look back on with horror and think, how could that happen? But that was the culture. Hopefully it's not the culture anymore. Um, we also have in paradox this uh, view of animals being fluffy Disney-like creatures and children, I think, are being fed so much wrong information about animals uh, and they do need to understand that animals are sentient, can suffer and can enjoy pleasure and experience pain like the rest of us. And if those messages are implanted early on in children, then I think um, to some extent the criminal law will have a lesser role to play because some of the more um, concerning acts of cruelty that we see out there may simply uh, not take place. One other area that is perhaps worth exploring in this wider context is joined up thinking between those who are convicted of animal cruelty offences and the extent to which that might be a risk factor for the authorities to consider in relation to what else is going on in that person's life and that person's home. Very brief example, in some states in America where uh, an animal is brought to a, a vet for treatment and the injuries are unexplained, the vet has a duty to contact the uh, local social services department uh, to put that on record with the view to triggering perhaps further inquiry into the circumstances of that person. As Mr Radford has said already, part of the problem can be the people themselves are in difficulty and if they're in difficulty in their own lives, that may be impacting on others, including children and vulnerable people, as well as animals. So there is perhaps an opportunity here to have some joined up thinking going on mm. in terms of linking uh, education at an early stage, but also reporting by other agencies who become aware of criminal animal cruelty into reporting to other agencies who may have uh, a relevant interest. And the SSPCA could give you more information about that when you take evidence from them, but yeah. because they've been at the forefront of this. Yeah, yeah. We, we, need to, we need to move on. To, um, I, I would like to pick up on the other aspect of the bill, which is about rehoming without a court order. And if you could maybe just outline for me why the, you think this is necessary and what this, um, the impacts of this are likely to be, making a distinction perhaps between agricultural livestock and domestic pets and, and, and why this why this court, uh, court order and the rehoming without it is going to make a difference to the welfare of both those types of, of animals. I think it follows on directly from what Mr Blair was saying about the, about the nature of animals. These offences are not just another criminal offence. They involve a living, feeling creature. And the problem is twofold. One, that the animals um, in... in context of agricultural animals, there can be large numbers of animals, um, who, who is responsible for them, where can they be kept, and it may well be that uh, they are coming up to slaughter weight or whatever and, and need to, for, for economic reasons, need to be disposed of as, as quickly as possible. So far as companion animals and the like are concerned, um, these animals, by their very nature, um, have had uh, uh, unfortunate experience, they've been looked after poorly. And at the present time, if the owner does not voluntarily uh, give up ownership of them, they have to be held by an agency, most commonly the SSPCA. Um, they are having to pay for this. It's blocking up their kennels so that other animals can't, can't be brought in. And it makes it, it can often uh, make worse already uh, inherent behavioural and other problems which have arisen from the way that they've been treated. There's a real issue with, for example, puppies yeah, as absolutely. well. So you might be having to keep them until they're adult dogs yeah. and they're not having that socialisation. Is that another reason for this? Absolutely. Yeah. absolutely. I mean, I, I'm a dog owner. I suspect some of the members here may, may have a dog and certainly experiences of dogs. And whether if you've had the experience of raising a dog from... A, puppyhood as I have, uh, that early stage in their life is absolutely crucial uh, in two ways. Um, we often hear of, my dog's not good with other dogs. Well, that's usually indicative of the dog's not been properly socialised with other dogs, which is classic in a puppy farming scenario, where puppies are effectively, breeding bitches are kept in cages without contact with other dogs. 
Equally, it's very important for a puppy in the early, early stages of life to be handled appropriately uh, by humans to create the inherent bond between canines and humans. If that's not done, you end up with a dog that is aggressive towards uh, people. And the difficulty that one would have here is that, let's assume the scenario of the puppy farm that gets raided, dogs have recovered, both adults uh, used for breeding and uh, the puppies. If they have to sit in some kind of limbo for months and months and months, then all of that work, and I, I readily accept the SSPCA do what they can in that scenario, but there's nothing better than a proper new home, particularly for a puppy, where some of the damage that might have been done can be mitigated or where steps can be taken to um, bring it on and socialise it appropriately. So there's a wider benefit to society there if we are to try and stem the problems that arise from problem dogs or as I would say, problem owners, but problem dogs that haven't been socialised properly early on in life. And if we simply hold them up in the limbo of the legal system until the owner uh, agrees to the transfer, or perhaps they don't, and we end up in an appeal process, then that wider public benefit is simply lost. We may have re rescued the puppy, but we may not have given it the life that it deserves. So the, the question, though, is looking at both sides of this. How do, how do we balance the rights of the animal and the rights of the owner in this situation. I mean, there, there is an issue there of you know, conviction and, and the, 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 the process of the law, and you could find a situation where the owner um, is not been prosecuted as a result of it, and they've lost, for example, a herd of cows, they've lost animals that they were um, rearing to sell. The, the, the bill does address that issue, convener, in the, in the sense that these anim animals um, can only be disposed of if the owner doesn't seek to have the order overturned. Um, so there is a protection there um, in that the, these animals won't simply be disposed of without the owner being aware. They have a limited period of three weeks, and that seems to me entirely appropriate. Right. Um, they have to be informed of, of what's intended and the notice the provisions of the notice in the bill are pretty detailed it, it does seem to me in, in addition to the practical uh, issues that, that mr blair has identified that there's an issue of principle here the the role of the law and the courts is to protect the vulnerable and by definition if an animal's condition is so poor that it has been taken into possession um, the principle should be that it is put in its the best position possible as soon as possible. Now, that doesn't automatically override the um, owner's rights, but it should be given priority and the owner, sh the owner should be on the owner to uh, argue against rather than the current position where the cards are stacked in the owner's favour. Okay, thank you. We'll have to move on. Stuart, would you be able to deal with the two themes that you wanted to speak I'll, on? I'll in the seek one to do that, Kavina. Thank you. Um, talking about compensation, which follows on uh, from this, uh, Section 11 of the Bill inserts uh, 32H uh, into the 2006 Act. And at uh, subparagraph 3, it uh, sets out that the value for compensation will be the greater of the value at the point that the animal is taken away from its present owner or the value at the end of the process of determining compensation. And I just wonder whether, given that that second value, because of interventions, medical, uh, veterinary treatment and so on, would increase the value of the animal, why that second provision exists at all. Why should it not simply be the value in the condition that the animal is taken away from the owner, however poor that may be, and it's been taken away for welfare reasons, should it not simply be that? Um, I, I make the observation, of course, less any expenses, but, but that's a separate issue, because the expenses could be substantially less than the increase in value. In fact, the value could be close to nil under some circumstances. Right. Okay, that's an adequate answer for my uh, for my, my 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 purposes. I always go and read the words in a bill. That's what I, I I tend to do. The other thing, of course, is that the compensation is determined 
before any criminal justice case may even have got into its formal process, um, should compensation be actually paid to someone who's going to go into a criminal justice system who, and the animal exists purely because of the criminal actions of the individual, should that individual re get any compensation whatsoever? In other words, should the decision about compensation not follow the completion of any criminal justice uh, process and potentially be determined to be zero, irrespective of what currently the drafting of the bill says? Second, very good point. Right. Well, in that case, let's move on to fixed penalty notices because we are, I know, short of time. Um, and, and, and really, um, I've seen fixed penalty notices happening uh, very, very effectively in low-level street crimes and drunkenness on a Saturday night and this sort of thing. Um, in relation to what the bill says about fixed penalty notices, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm unclear, perhaps because I haven't read it thoroughly enough, whether they can be uh, uh, put by, uh, whether SSPCA can uh, administer them or whether it has to be a constable. Uh, and do you think it should be both? Because it would seem, given that uh, the SSPA, CEA can take into uh, possession, and therefore they have powers in relation to this, um, is the way it's constructed sensible and uh, a good addition to the law? Yes, it is a good addition to the law. Um, it, it's a person appointed under the Act who, who, who can, and my understanding is that uh, most SSPCA inspectors have got have been granted powers under the Act. Uh, as I said earlier, I think I think the fix. This this makes the, 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 the regime much more flexible at both ends, the serious end and the less serious end. And where I see fixed penalty notices being particularly valuable is where somebody is not complying with a care notice, um, but it would be disproportionate to, to prosecute them. Uh, but, but, but there must be there must be a record of who's being given... Yeah. yeah. Questions on Finn's law, Angus. Yeah, OK. Um, thanks, convener, uh, and good morning to the panel. Um, we, we've seen from the consultation or, or our call for views um, broad support for the introduction of a Scottish Finn's law. Um, and it's perhaps worth noting that a, a small number of the respondents suggested the bill should go further uh, and require harsher penalties for attacks on service animals. Uh, in fact, one respondent suggested that there's a, a case for introducing a new offence of uh, intentionally or recklessly causing injury to a service animal. So, um, do you feel the proposals in the bill for a Scottish Finns law are an appropriate mechanism for increasing protection for service animals? And um, what do you believe the implications of the change could be? If I may, I may, I may speak, I drafted the uh, ALO response on this point in particular. And um, what struck me when I um, embarked on this was the, the level of violence that's out there in relation to service animals, um, including horses, which I found extraordinary. Uh, I ride myself, I'm around horses, and the idea of anyone uh, hitting a horse, punching a horse, struck me as firstly bizarre, but it goes on, and there are many, many examples of this. So the issue is, wider than simply dogs, it's any type of service animal, and I think there would have to be a clear recognition of what we're talking about. Uh, there is a large body of material, certainly from England, indicating uh, incidents involving attacks on service animals, public order offences in particular, where horses are deployed, dogs are deployed. And there is a paradox, I think, that one can be committing an offence such as the breach of the peace, disorderly behaviour, assaulting a police officer, but at the same time, if the service animal becomes engaged with you, you're entitled to say, well, the suffering was necessary because I was defending myself. There's, it's simply incoherent in my view. So I do think this bill is a valuable way of addressing this current anomaly in Scotland. Um, in terms of uh, impact, I, I think, again, that has to be in terms of appropriate sentencing. Uh, if someone um, commits this offence, in the context of uh, <coughs> public order, for example, there may be an issue there whether that's an aggravating factor overall in the circumstances of the public order offence. But in any event, I, I think there is merit in having an independent uh, penalty um, to make it clear 
uh, that uh, animals, uh, and this is a controversial area, of course, animals have rights in a sense, or at least we have duties towards them, and that includes those who uh, assault animals in the course of their behaviour. It's simply not appropriate. As for other taking, making it wider, I think the difficulty one always has is that why do we single out certain um, members of society for particular treatment? In the, days of the, the last days of the death penalty, of course, it was only s sentences, uh, the sentence of death was only handed out in relation to those who killed police officers or prison officers and so on. And that was one of the anomalies which um, people called brought forward to say, well, that's another reason we can't support this, because it introduces these arbitrary distinctions. Um, my own personal view, very much my personal view, is that there is an argument for a higher penalty for attacks on service animals, simply because of the deterrence element. Um, but I, I'm not aware, certainly, of any widespread body of evidence or opinion out there that, that, that reflects that view at this time. But there is a, a, certainly a clear body of opinion and evidence that supports something resembling Finn's law, and the model in the bill very much fits that uh, body of concern. I support Finn's law. I think it, as Mr Blair says, should go beyond dogs. It should be any service animal that's been trained and being used in the service of the public. And I would invite the committee to consider taking this further to include assistance animals. There is a particular issue here because the nature, and we're talking mostly about a uh, dog attack on dog. Um, the nature of a person's disability may mean that they are unable to see the danger or to be aware of the danger um, and to take avoiding action, such as a normal dog walker could. And secondly, the nature of these attacks can, can result in the dogs not being fit to carry on their role. And clearly that has implications for the dog. It has implications for the person who, who the dog is, is assisting. It is really serious. And there are relatively few of these instances, but the number doesn't lessen the importance of them move on to talking about wildlife crime and uh, apologies to members that wanted to come in the back of that we are running out of time. Claudia, can you pick oh, that Thank up, you, please? convener. Uh, uh, panel, we've already um, uh, looked at um, the increasing of penalties and, um, the, um, and moving to serious crime. Um, I, I wonder if there are any comments on, on that in relation to wildlife crime, but if not, I'm also interested in the implications of the changes in the bill for the investigation of wildlife crime in relation to um, changing statutory time limits and also potentially enabling police authorisation or um, of um, covert um, video surveillance. And I'm going to give all, all the points at once because I'm, I do apologise, but we are short at time, of time. I've always been told to only ask one question at a time, but I'll, I'll, I'll give it all. Um, are there views on other work or measures that may be required to achieve the aims of increasing deterrence for these offences, um, such as um, the um, use of vicarious liability or resourcing of investigations and enforcement uh, or recommendations from the Prusty Review. So I've, I've thrown a lot in there, but whoever wanted to answer particularly on any of those issues would be most valued. So for something on vicarious liability. Thank you. Um, typically, one is dealing with, uh, in the context of wildlife crime, large areas of land under the management of an entity, a company yeah. or a trust, uh, who in turn will employ stalkers, keepers and other uh, persons on the land to uh, manage the land. And it does strike me as anomalous that in the context of something which, in, at the end of the day, is an industrial activity, albeit carried out in the context mm -hmm. of a rural environment, mm -hmm. that the parallels that we have in other areas of the law, such as, as used to be the case under the Factories Act yes. and under the Health and Safety at Work Act, that persons who employ uh, other persons to perform a role in the context of a business are often vicariously liable, both civilly and criminally. Mm -hmm. And... In my view, there isn't really any principal distinction, if there ever was, for maintaining the view that vicarious responsibility has no role or a limited role in the context of the rural, rural environment. I think it was pretty much seen against the background of uh, those working the land 
being independent contractors coming in and uh, providing services to the landowner. That may have had some validity in the days of the Victorian estates, but not anymore in my submission in relation to large estates which are managed effectively as either means of producing um, game for the table uh, or as uh, sporting estates uh, where there is much money to be made and where, uh, in my, res my respectful submission, where there's much money to be made, then there has to be, as there is the case in relation to industrial matters, um, vicarious responsibility on the part of those who are in overall management of the uh, site, subject, of course, to the usual defences of reasonable diligence and due diligence being taken to cover those situations where uh, members of the estate uh, do break the law, but that's against all the best efforts of the estate management team to ensure that that doesn't take place. There are so many parallels in our law from liquor licensing through the health and safety legislation um, that do have vicarious liability. And in my submission, it, it's really quite anomalous. We don't see that um, as, as, as an accepted proposition in a general sense in this area of law. So in your view, would there have to be a direct um, uh, prosecution of of the alleged perpetrator, or is evidence of um, an alleged crime sufficient? Yes, it is sufficient. I mean, there are precedents for that already in relation to uh, the uh, Licensing Scotland Act, in relation to alcohol licensing, which is an area of my practice. Um, there are provisions in that act which make it clear that one can go against the shop owner um, not necessarily the shop assistant who, for right. example, sells alcohol to a child, uh, where the real issue is with the owner, not the assistant. So there, there are precedents within our law already that work very much on that basis. That's helpful. Thank you. We want to wait for a wrap up. We only have a couple of minutes. Point to pick up in vicarious liability in the criminal context, as you see it in driving offences, for instance, cause and permit very, very common one with regard to a contravention of section 143, the insurance, where the person is the owner of the car, is one of the and the person driving, you know, two people. So it's very common prosecution and quite a successful prosecution method because of who actually is fault has it really been that there's been no insurance. Yeah, Mark, you have a final question for the panel. It's just a point that um, Claudia had raised earlier on about the powers of the SSPCA. Do, do you see a, a mismatch between the powers they have in relation to domestic animals um, to gather evidence and the lack of powers over gathering evidence in relation to wildlife crime? Yes, there, is a, there is an issue there, and I'm sure they'll be happy to give you evidence so on, your that. View on it. I, uh, 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 my view is that the SSPCA should be given more powers, um, but at the same time treated as a public body so that they would be subject to judicial review as other public bodies. I want to thank the three of you for your time this morning. It's been very, very helpful. And sorry we've run out of time. We're going to suspend briefly to allow a change in panel.
We continue with hearing evidence at Stage 1 in relation to the Animals and Wildlife Penalties, Protections and Powers Bill. Um, the roundtable that we're about to embark on focuses on animal welfare issues in the bill. And before I introduce everyone, I just want to mention that um, there is no need to actually mention individual cases or names of people. Please, please speak in general terms in case we get ourselves into bother. Uh, but I'm sure you all know that, but just a friendly reminder. I'm delighted to welcome Libby Anderson, the policy advisor of One Kind, Runa Hannigan, Deputy Veterinary Directors of Dog Dogs Trust, Howard Bridges, Chief Executive Officer of the Edinburgh Cat and Dog Home, Robbie Marsland, Director Scotland of the League Against Cruel Sports, and Penny Middleton, the Policy Manager for Animal Health and Welfare of the NFUS. Good morning to you all. Um, I will start off by asking some general views on the rationale for the increase, increases to penalties in the bill from your perspective, um, if you could uh, maybe want to, to chime in why you think this bill and the provisions in this bill are necessary. Um, if anyone would like to go first, just indicate to me. <coughs> Libby? Always happy to kick off, convener. Um, first of all, I think the case has been made over several years that the penalties had fallen behind those in other countries, other European countries in particular. There was also a strong public view that the punishment element of sentencing, and Stuart Stevenson referred earlier to the different elements of sentencing, but the punishment was one which was very much a public focus. Um, the view of one kind is that there, there is a role for that and that we should have equivalence with other jurisdictions. We're also very pleased that wildlife offences are coming up to the same level in welfare terms as animal welfare for domestic animals, so we, we think that's very important. But I would stress that from one kind's view that the importance is efficacy of sentencing and that we're not focused only on punishment and uh, revenge, if you like. We want justice, but we also want prevention and protection for animals. And having the right mix and the right flexibility for, for the courts to make decisions on what that, what is I'm, I'm trying to yeah. mix them up words, but the efficacy of the suite of yes. things that can be deployed. Yes, and the, the fact is that with judicial policy and with the available penalties, community payback orders are much, much more commonly used in these offences, and they have been recognised as a useful tool. Uh, the, the issue is what measures you attach to the community payback orders. So Gillian Maudsley referred to unpaid work, and that's the most common measure that's attached. But there are several. Uh, another one is supervision by a social worker. And of course, a skilled criminal justice social worker with knowledge of animal welfare issues would probably be able to help an offender to consider their, their behavior. And the other uh, potential measure is to require a convicted person to attend various programmes. So it might be a domestic violence programme, such as mm. the Caledonian mm. Men's Programme. And as I think you know from our submission, we believe that a retraining, teaching people empathy, understanding for animals could have longer term and far reaching effects in changing people's behaviour. Uh, maybe something you'd like to come back to. But later. at the other end of the scale, we've got the organised crime element. Absolutely. Where we're very, yeah. very serious yes. Um, yes. situations that might require that flexibility to have a custodial Could, Couldn't service. agree more, and that's why we do support and feel there's a need for the higher penalties. Okay. Ruth, Irina, sorry. Um, uh, yes, I just wanted to um, echo Libby's thoughts on this um, higher penalty uh, element of it, because I think the presumption against the against the twelve month sentencing is something that takes people out of this system of of the sort of penalty being something that would deter them doing this again. I actually agree with Libby as well in the fact that we need to be able to reach for support and assistance in some of these cases for people who are struggling. Um, and I think we heard evidence before about people who were, who were being um, brought up uh, due to negligence. And actually, that can be education and understanding that can then be accessed and, and brought through the system too. Um, but coming back to the um, organised crime element of things, it's something that we're very close to. As an organisation, we understand the effect of puppy, puppy smuggling, um, and certainly puppy farming is an element of that as well. Um, and the, the seriousness of what these animals are enduring um, in the process that they're brought forwards for 
basically for profit mm -hmm. um, is, is appalling. So we really want to bring the, the sort of sentencing up to a level that actually echoes um, the seriousness of the crime that they're, um, they're committing. Okay. Finley. Thank you, Convener. First, I'd like to declare an interest as a member of the NFU because I'm going to direct this question uh, primarily at, uh, at Penny. Um, this is in relation to other types of penalties. We've, we've heard about how uh, other uh, methods of punishment, if you like, uh, can be imposed. Can I ask you what your opinion is on, uh, on animal welfare issues, how effectively the use of uh, community payback orders and disqualification orders are being used in agriculture and, and whether you think um, you know, the bill goes far enough in terms of that sort of penalty? Um, I would say probably um, you know, the use of disqualification notices, obviously that would be you know, for some of the more serious cases, I think that that is appropriate and effective. In terms of the level of the penalties, my comment would be that um, yes, you've got to have appropriate penalties to, um, to deter people, but the as far as farmers are concerned, they face probably their first port of call for any offence of an animal welfare nature would actually be to penalise them under the cross-compliance system, which is a much simpler process, no burden of proof. Um, and some of the fines and things that they'll get through the uh, cross-compliance system are significantly higher than some of the penalties you'd be talking about here. So, um, you know, I don't see... I see that as being the bigger deterrent on the farming side. Okay, and, and to the general panel, just thoughts on community payback and disqualification orders. Disqualification orders are important as an element of this because there are people who may not um, learn or, or um, be empathetic towards animals at all, I think, within the processes that we understand can happen um, and the issues that some animals can suffer. Um, I think what's really valuable in that... Um, that part of what we're talking about on the disqualification order is actually having a recognised um, body that um, holds that information and is able to cross and to share it across various um, elements of society so that um, this can be enforced in a better way um, and I think um, upheld in a better way as well. It's Libby, and then I'll Stuart would like to ask a short question. Thank you, Convener. Just <coughs> to add on disqualification orders, and it was mentioned in the previous panel um, that, first of all, there is room for a register of disqualification orders because it is very hard for enforcement agencies to know whether these already exist. The other point I wanted to make is that um, we would expect them to be considered as part of the process after conviction because the Act already requires that. But what doesn't happen is that there's any open understanding of the reasons why a disqualification order is not given. And in our submission, we suggested that this should be given and explained in open court because there may be reasons why disqualification is not necessary. But if we could move to a presumption that it must be considered, Perhaps an automatic ban cases will vary, but certainly automatic consideration and then explanation so that the public understand why it hasn't been um, given. Mark, do you want to come in now? Uh yeah, I just wanted to open it up, convener, into because uh, obviously the bill is about sentencing, but it's about what, what we need alongside that um, to ensure that there are successful prosecutions. So. You know, is there a need for sentencing guidelines, um, other issues about resourcing um, certain bodies, or indeed the function of certain bodies, such as the SSPCA, should those be extended or not? Other issues around the decision-making um, process that the Crown Estate comes to about whether to take forward a case or not? Robin um, Marsland. Yeah, I, I'd like to, to, to take up one particular issue on that, which is the admissibility of uh, video evidence or NGO video evidence, which um, I don't understand, <laughs> I'm afraid. I, um, I've been looking at this, this issue for the, first, for the last five years um, when the League started to, uh, to look at... This is a, an issue of fox hunting, but, but still is relevant to, to, to many of the issues that we're looking at. Uh, it was explained to me that uh, NGO video evidence isn't um, admissible in a, in a Scottish court, and I know that the RSPB have had um, difficulties on that front. 
Notwithstanding that, the League has, has successfully uh, submitted video evidence to two courts uh, in Scotland. Um, and as I say, I'm, I, I was pleased that that was admissible uh, in those cases. I, I kind of understand, I've had an explanation of why that was the case. I still don't understand it. Uh, um, and I'm quite, quite close to it, and I think there are others who, who don't quite understand why. I don't think so. Should be looking at higher sentences. Does it change the admissibility or not? I, I, it seems to me it's, it's a fiscal decision. Right. Um, and uh, as I say, I've, I've never really understood how one decision differs from another. I, it's been explained. I, there have been ways in which it's explained to me, but I can't see how that relates back to the law. Okay. Are there, are there other points on, on what, what's needed around the, uh, the changes in the bill to bring successful prosecutions or not? Yeah, um, just on the admissibility question, uh, I think what I understood is that the, the police would be able to use the uh, surveillance techniques because of the increased sentences, the, um, the, the standards for meeting the regulation of inter um, investigative powers, Scotland Act, w would be met. But I did not get the impression that those would be extended to NGOs. And uh, like Robbie Marsden's organisation, one kind has experience of observing what appeared to us to be offences, but which the video footage was not found to be admissible. It was all bound up with access to land and uh, whether we were conducting surveillance. It is still a very murky area. On the other part of Mark Ruskell's question, I think clearly a number of people have mentioned the extension of powers to investigate wildlife offences to the Scottish SPCA, and we would wholeheartedly support that. You have 60 trained inspectors who are very knowledgeable about gathering evidence, very knowledgeable about all the legislation, and I think that's a resource that should be harnessed, and I understand the offer is still open. Runa? Um, yep, I was really just going to um, outline that we feel that the SSBCA should have um, more powers to assist with some of these cases as well. Um, but I think that they are going to be the people best placed to answer the questions on this. Um, can, I, can I quickly ask yes. something on that? Uh, just, uh, it's been highlighted to me, thanks, Gavina, that there could be a conflict of interest in relation to um, SSPCA, and I'm, not, I'm putting that in a completely neutral way. And we will be um, taking evidence from them next week, but I just wondered if there were any quick comments on that. Why would that have been... What would be the purpose of that? Um, what, would yeah. what, would, what would be the conflict? Yes. What is the conflict? I, I, I'm oh, asking right. the okay. question because some, be, some people a few years ago in the last session of the Parliament said that there could be, it could be seen as a conflict of interest, and I don't understand why, and I've never managed to tease that out. Mm. But nobody's got any comment on it. Maybe that. we can put that to them if they've had yeah. that kind of thing. Okay. Uh, Stuart, you had a quick question. Um, yes, it was just kind of... We're talking about sentencing, and I thought FBNs immediately, fixed penalty notices, related to, uh, to in particular, to what Libby and Runa said. And, and Libby made the point that community sentences, in particular, um, can often be useful in playing people into resetting their attitudes and behaviours to animals. And I just wonder if that led to any worry about fixed penalty notices, which are, of course, short of criminal sentences, um, accepting that they are offered and have to be accepted before you can, you can do them, whether there are any issues that we might be allowing some people who actually are in need of that assistance to better behaviours drop out of the system because we're offering a fixed penalty notice. I'm not expressing a personal view, I think they are of use, but I wanted to test whether my view is correct, perhaps in the light of what Libby and Runa had to say on, uh, on the sentencing issue. Um, yes, I, th I think obviously the bill allows for regulations to be made and those will need to be scrutinised very carefully when, they, uh, when they're brought forward to create the fixed penalty notice regime. But our position is unequivocally that but they must only be used for minor technical offences. And if there is any suggestion or belief that an animal has suffered unnecessarily, we don't think that they would be appropriate. However, that said, 
in the terms of the wider regime and particularly the burdens on local authorities who will have a, a major role in using these and who I believe are very in favour of fixed penalty notices, if it increases o enforcement overall and makes people more mindful of their obligations, then we definitely support them. But they certainly are not applicable to the more serious offences where an animal suffered. So, so the, you, your view is they would only be appropriate where there is a welfare issue which is not yet led to an well, outcome that is particularly adverse mm. um, and, and that that's where the, the, the issue lie. And that, are you sorry, also, that's, not, that's not exactly our Well, that's why, yeah, I'm, that's yes. why I'm teasing out to see if, if that's yes. where you are, because I, I just want to be, us all to be clear. Um, equally, was I hearing that uh, the fixed penalty notice, you're, you're suggesting that when the regulations are drawn up, the penalty need not offered, need not be a financial penalty, it might be a penalty of another character. Well, that had not occurred to me, but I think it's a very interesting suggestion. Um, if there is a welfare issue, I think the care notice is the route to go, and Mike right. Radford described very clearly how those operate, but I, I couldn't see a fixed penalty notice being appropriate for a welfare offence. I sh should let others in here, I think. Um, absolutely, I agree. And I think um, I like the point that you're, you're making as well in the fact that it doesn't always access people give people access to the interventions that might help support them and manage a problem moving forwards. Um, I think one of the points that was made in the submission was also that um, the fixed penalty notices should be held on register as well so that those can be um, viewed and understood in, in case they escalate. Um, and I think those are things that are really valuable to have within the system. Uh, Finlay. I want to look back at <clears throat> excuse me, the, the penalties that uh, are under the... The, the, health and welfare, the Animal Health and Welfare Act 2006 and whether you think the current penalties are appropriate for animal offences other than are included in, in the bill. So we're looking at, uh, and we mentioned in the previous uh, session, mutilation, uh, poisoning, abandonment uh, and whatever, and also whether the scope of animals included. Um, what's your, your thoughts on the, uh, how the Act deals with fish and other marine animals? Is that a the scope wide enough and appropriate in the in the new bill? Um, I think it's, it's quite a scope when you're thinking about all the different species that we're talking about, and that's from a professional perspective, from a veterinary perspective. Um, but um, from the other elements of the Act, I think it's something that we did raise um, as Dogs Trust, just trying to make sure that things like mutilation <coughs> and um, cruel operations, poisons, um, and various elements that are contained within the older Act are actually brought in under this umbrella of um, the bill that we're introdu you're introducing. So I think it's important that it's, it's uh, the sentencing guidelines for those acts are still within the welfare and unnecessary suffer suffering that we're discussing today. I think it's very important that they're brought up to the same level. And what about the scope of including other animals? Because we all immediately think of dogs and cats and whatever. So what about other fish, for example. Um, for, forgive me, uh, another comment, if I may. Um, yes, f first of all, on the offences, I, when the original 2000 Act came in, 2006 Act came in, um, w I felt that the abandonment offence should be an, an offence of unnecessary suffering rather than a welfare offence. And that, that is still my view because abandonment can lead to severe unnecessary suffering. Although I acknowledge, as was said earlier, that section 19 would then be applicable. But it is a good point you make. In terms of the scope of the Act, it, it does cover fish, obviously, because they're vertebrates. But one kind has also suggested that it should now be extended to cover decapod crustaceans, so lobsters and crabs and prawns, and cephalopods, octopus, squid. Um, they're, they're, probably the act came just a little bit too early for the evidence of their sentience and their ability to suffer to be absolutely established in everybody's mind. But there has been a great deal of research that shows that they do have that capacity and that they do need protection because they are used in restaurants, food trade, zoos and aquariums. Um, there, therefore, we would welcome consideration of whether it could be extended. 
There is a provision to do that by regulations already under Section 16, but I think it is a good time to air this. I want to move the conversation on to another part of the proposed act or the bill um, about rehoming without a court order. And I asked the previous panel, we have a situation at the moment where court order is required. Um, this bill proposes that you can rehome animals, you can you know, um, sell off animals um, without a court order. So we have, on the one hand, the, the owners of those animals and their rights, and then we have the rights of the animals involved and striking the right balance between those rights. Any views on, on that from, from your organisation's perspectives? Yes. Um, I think um, coming from the stance of a, an organisation that, that has kennels, has shelters um, and rehomes animals, um, I think that the three-week uh, time frame is appropriate. Um, it would be lovely if it was not as long as that, but I think in the in the guidelines that have been set out, it does allow for the human element to be to be there, so that the people can appeal and um, and manage this. Um, and I think it's really important that at this stage, it, it seems that animals are seen as property um, and held waiting for trial where actually they're sentient beings and we need to consider their welfare through this whole process um, and by in, by allowing them to move forwards um, and be rehomed um, and be managed better than hanging on in a, in a shelter environment for a lengthy period of time until the court um, convenes and, and decides on sentencing I think is a really important factor in this. And we talked about the socialisation of animals particularly um, puppies um, as being as a, a, a big area of concern when you have these animals in limbo, can be up to and certainly I know a, a case of up to two years. Um, but what is the impact of that? I mean, we've got the Edinburgh Cat and Dog Home, we've got yourselves here as well. What's the kind of impact on on those animals when they're in limbo like that? Um, yeah, obviously th there's a cost involved, which is a, a cost to the, the charity itself, but the the actual welfare of those animals is uh, put at great risk obviously because of uh, the length of time some of those as you see a year or two years actually kept in kennels uh, we at the edinburgh dog and cat home obviously would prefer to be able to rehome those particular dogs and cats in our case um, as quickly as possible that's the only way forward as far as we're concerned three weeks obviously we support but as runa says uh, if it could be short other than that well, all well and good but uh, certainly has an impact on the animals and obviously the staff who have to, have to care for them on a on a day-to-day -day basis as well so yeah and i think your point on on the sort of younger animals and the puppies is really appropriate um because if they're brought into the kennel environment early and they're waiting a year or so before the um sentencing is is occurring then they've got a huge socialization period within the first sort of four months of their life um and we're restricting that they're just going to be um sort of institutionalized as such within the kennel environment instead of um being able to sort of understand the wider world yeah. in a better way. Yeah. And from an agricultural point of view, Penny, um, obviously this will have an impact. Yeah, I mean, it's a ver very big decision, taking any decision to seize farm animals. Um, it's not as easy to care for them and kennel them and that sort of thing. And you could be talking large numbers of animals. So it can be an extremely difficult sort of barrier as to what you're actually going to do with those animals should you seize them and sort of limbo period if you've got to hold them for long periods of time can make it again even more difficult you've got animals that might be coming up to um, the age when they should be going to slaughter or you know sort of various management practices um, so you know, I think you do need to have a clear plan in your head as to what you're going to do with farm animals when you seize them and so knowing your pathway and having a sort of fairly quick resolution is important the only slight concern that we have is the fact that we would say that a lot of the time when you are looking at serious welfare problems on farm quite often there's a mental health um, aspect behind it um, with the farmer and it is just making sure that the fact that the farmer does understand what's happening and is given the opportunity to properly engage with the outcome as to um, what happens to those animals. And you've both, I mean, you've, you've all mentioned about the financial impact and having a financial impact on charities where I mean, you could be using that income to, you know, 
divert in, in other, other ways, but also have an, a financial impact on local authorities as well if they're having to, to care for agricultural animals in the yeah. limbo situation. There's obviously a huge cost involved in um, taking over and caring for um, farm animals. Um, I mean, you might, quite often they'll try and do it in situ, and but you've still got to pay somebody to come on and feed them and care for them. Um, and that might put them in a difficult situation if you've got an owner that's um, not cooperative. As I say, it's, it tends to be a very difficult and a very big and brave decision before you're actually talking about seizing farm animals. But I think it does help if you've got a much clearer pathway of how you're going to handle those animals. Um, before I, I move to questions on this theme from Finlay Carson, I just want to bring in the compensation element. That Stuart, Stuart Stevenson brought up in the previous panel. Stuart, you may want to revise some of the, the, the questions you had there and, yeah. and, and get our view from the yeah, panel and here. we'll try and get uh, as concise a set of answers as well. Um, I, th I think the, um, the, the, the key question is whether it's appropriate uh, to allow the increase in the value of an animal post it being seized from its uh, current keeper uh, to be put into the calculation of the compensation. I think that was the fundamental question which I got an unambiguous answer uh, on uh, uh, last time. And let me just relate that also to just the more general question in that uh, from another domain of uh, criminal justice, heroin is a legal drug, but almost all heroin is held illegally. We don't compensate heroin dealers. Why should we compensate people who have animals where it's uh, illegal? Why should we do it at all? Could anyone like to... On any of those points? Yes. I, I heard your point earlier in the earlier session as well about the compensation value before and after um, and I appreciate that and I think certainly from a charitable perspective when we've been involved in some of these cases um, there is quite a, a lot of resource um, placed into the animals that come into our care um, and so essentially if you're looking at value as the outcome it may well be that they do increase in value at the end of a period of care um, rather than having that value at the beginning of it. I think it's a, it's a hard question to answer. I think it's something that, um, you know, from our perspective, we'd, we understand your point is a point well made, um, that the beginning of the process of three weeks and the, and the end of the process of three weeks could be very different. But it does come back to that whole issue of, you know, innocent until proven guilty. I mean, mm -hmm. If you're particularly in a situation where you've got livestock and then we go through a process, those animals aren't kept in a situation and then, um, you know, the, the welfare issues around mm. that. But at the same time, if a person isn't convicted at the end of it, then, you know, a business hasn't gone, gone down the tubes. Meanwhile, I mean, that, that has to be taken into account, yeah? I, I think, in fairness, comp compensation for commercial animals ought to cover that adequately. And of course it is legal to keep animals um, and when things go wrong, that's the mischief that you're addressing rather than the keeping of the animals in the first place, which is something to be encouraged. But what this does throw up for me is the tension between commercial animals, which are bred and reared to be sold, therefore they have a clear commercial value and domestic mm. animals that are kept as pets. As far as I can see, the legislation would cover all pets. You might say as a matter of principle, the, the, you know, being able to remove them is desirable. In many circumstances, you want it to extend this protection to all animals, but there's a very difficult dynamic when you're talking about a relationship of love and care and companionship with a pet and arguably that cannot be compensated for because even bad owners very often love their pets, but they just make mistakes or, or are careless. So my understanding is that the intention is for the bill to be primarily used for commercial situations and livestock and far, uh, traded puppies, traffic puppies are the examples that are normally given. I think it will be possible to manage the compensation for that and to achieve an appropriate level to make sure that people are not rewarded for their own carelessness. Mm. But if, if it is used for 
domestic pets, I think, uh, would be very difficult to estimate. Penny. Penny. So, sorry, can I just come in and yep. say, of course, another part of the bill does say the court can determine that an order that no compensation be paid yes. in any event. Yes. yes. Sorry. Penny. Sorry. Um, again, I think this is, you know, as suggested, very much more of a question for livestock. Um, you know, obviously, if you take in poor quality livestock and then feed them up, there would be higher value at the end of it. Um, I think you know, our sort of position is the fact that it probably should be the value of the animal at the time of seizure that's compensated. Um, you know, you've got co costs and things associated with um, improving the um, the standard of the animals. Um, and I suppose that could, the other thing is that that could come in under the sort of reasonable costs of keeping the animal. So you know, it could be taken into account by the value of the animal at the end, I suppose, but you'd take off more for the expense involved in getting that animal to a higher value. But probably the simplest would be to value them on, and fairest, value them on the um, value at the time of seizure. Claudia, you've wanted to ask a question. Just, just very briefly, convener, thank you. I just wanted to come back to you, Runa, and, and ask you, I, I think I'm correct in saying that you said that animals were sentient beings, not property. And now, I, I, I'm just, I'm not in any way um, wanting to do anything other than try and understand that, because I think it's an interesting remark, and it does perhaps connect with also Stuart Stevenson's question, which hasn't been answered, and I understand there are many reasons why it wouldn't be, but about, um, is compensation really appropriate, you know, um, if, if you're a puppy farmer, you know, why, if you're a drug dealer, you don't get compensated for your mm. property because it's illegal property and surely puppy farming is illegal. So I, I'd just like to sort of tease out these issues a bit further. Yeah. No, I Sorry? Don't. Puppy farming's not illegal. Okay, well, there you go. Um, it will be when Emma's done <coughs> the bill. <laughs> well, yeah. no, no, not necessarily. I, I'd understood that it was, but yeah. anyway. Okay, I stand corrected. From, um, to... to um, clarify the point. I appreciate. Um, I'm not leg I'm not legally trained. Yeah. So when it comes to me talking about property, I suppose I'm trying to marry this up against um, something that's seized from a house in a in a setting that can be kept until a court convenes to to provide sentencing versus an animal that's seized um, within this setting because that's a very different um, piece of property if that's what we're talking about um, and we're looking at a sentient being that holding that animal for a lengthy period of time can create its own problems on a welfare basis, which is what this is essentially trying to address, is the welfare mm -hmm. of the animals and how they're managed. Mm -hmm. um, I think <clears throat> I do take your point, and I think um, puppy farming is one of those elements which is um, a very challenging area to, um, to address. Um, it's not illegal to have a dog, but then when you look at the effects of what puppy farming does create for the dogs that are in the care of certain people who are perhaps... Um, related to organised crime and other areas within um, society, we have an issue um, where the profits there are far outweigh um, maybe what the value of the animals are on the ground as well. Um, and I think we've got to try and look at the penalties actually addressing this uh, more closely. Um, and I think that's going back to the actual penalty element of this rather than the compensation element of it. Um, and I feel that within the sort of welfare parameters of what we're discussing today. Welfare is a very, very important thing to take into account. Um, and if people are <coughs> negligent and are actively being negligent um, and not doing it unknowingly, then that is puppy farming. Um, and I think it's something that we need to try and define within the parameters of what this Bill is trying to introduce. Um, and I think that's something that you are looking at with all the questions that have come through um, in the last couple of hours, is looking at actually where are we making these decisions. And I agree with the, um, the point about guidelines around the sentencing, because I think that helps us to, to weigh up where each of these areas are positioned. Thank you. Uh, Sorry, Libby, did you want to come in on that? Very briefly yeah. on, on compensation, just to reiterate, I think it's important what Stuart Stevenson raised, that um, the compensation would be forfeited. It's subject to any order of a convicting court. The relevant owner's right to compensation is forfeited in whole or in part. Mm. So the court could provide for that. I, I think it's unlikely this would lead to anyone profiting by their negligence yeah. or mm. cruelty. Yeah. Finley, you had a quick question before we move on. Yeah, to well, it's, it, it's quite clear that there's, there's 
a various range of different implications for uh, the proposals for different types of animals, whether they're commercial or whether they're companion animals or whatever. Uh, and we want to ensure a robust process is in place to make sure that uh, sales or rehoming are done safely and, and appropriately. However, are the panel con uh, content that the agencies in receipt of the potential new powers under the bill are sufficiently accountable uh, and otherwise equipped to use these powers effectively and fairly? Anyone want to yes. take that on? Yes. <laughs> Libby, and then I'll come to uh, you. Yes. <laughs> oh, that's a, just a so, yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. I, I presume you're meaning SSPCA and the ability of their um, staff to, or their, if, yeah, I, I agree. Yeah, I think yes. Any other views on that? Yep. Mark, you had a, a question on this theme. Um, well, it was actually just to, just to look again at, at, at the scope of the bill, because the, the, the bill is... I guess extending the uh, potential for maximum sentences for crimes where there's unnecessary suffering and, and fighting, but it but it does exclude some other areas. And it's just to get get your thoughts on that. I mean, it doesn't include poisoning, for example. So I wonder I wonder how how appropriate that that sort of catch-all of unnecessary suffering is, or if there are other areas. I mean, for example, if I poisoned a greyhound, would that be unnecessary suffering, or would that be poisoning? Would that be Are you specifically talking about the animal health and welfare section, or are we moving into the wildlife side as well? Um, I think across across mm, both of those so, areas. Um, yeah. as, as Mike Radford said, it, it would be covered by Section 19 on unnecessary suffering, um, but but it is a fair point that if if the poisoning section would, was used, it would still be a lesser penalty, and that would be a matter of concern. Um, the the other thing that we noticed in the wildlife section, the possession of pesticides remains an offence at the lower end of sentencing, whereas, of course, the welfare implications and public safety and health implications of possessing <coughs> pesticides are potentially very serious. So that's the sort of penalty we thought might require to be reviewed. Would, would that include the conservation impact of using a, a pesticide, for example, or...? You know, digging out a badger set, for example. You know, there's, a, there's an animal welfare implication, but there are wider implications mm. on the environment. Uh, which, and I'm, I'm just interested to know whether you, whether you think the provisions within the bill really sort of capture that that wider impact and the severity of, of crimes. Anyone? Yes. <laughs> well, when you move, when you look at the new penalties under Protection of Badgers Act and Wildlife and Countryside Act, they are considerably increased. So that the five-year uh, maximum sentence and an unlimited fine are the highest sentences. On, uh, it's very varied, as you know, within different categories of offences. But at the, the higher level, and that would include digging out a badger set, I think. Um, that, that would attract a much higher sentence. Right. Okay. Yes. To reiterate what uh, Libby was saying about possession of pesticides and, and the, uh, the level uh, that that's regarded. I think in our experience, um, best, it's not unusual to find caches of pesticides hidden um, on, on estates, uh, which the use, um, if they're used in the way that we suspect, leads to not only um, high animal welfare impact, but also uh, it can be used for illegal targeting of protected species. So we, we, I think that would be something that would be worth considering in terms of the, the level of that one. Okay. Would anyone else like to, before we move on, to talk about Finn's Law, Penny? You, or, no? No. Right, we um, want to address uh, Finn's Law, Angus. Thanks, Convener. Um, the panel have heard me ask a, a similar question on Finn's Law uh, to the, the, the previous panel. Um, so from the consultation, uh, we've, we've seen broad support for the introduction of a Scottish Finn's Law. Uh, and it's worth noting that a small number of the respondents uh, to the consultation suggested that the bill should go further and require harsher penalties for attacks on service animals. Uh, also, uh, one respondent suggested there's a case for introducing a new offence of intentionality or recklessly causing injury. 
uh, to uh, service animals. So, um, do, do you feel that the proposals in the bill uh, for a, a Scottish Finns law are an appropriate mechanism for increasing protection for service animals, and uh, what implications that change, uh, uh, what implications of the change could be? Robert. Fully support uh, Finns law, obviously. Um, one thing uh, I may suggest is that um, certainly service dogs uh, and animals, uh, horses as well, which we talked about earlier on, but I think assistance dogs also should maybe be included, so the likes of guide dogs and so on. Yeah, the previous panel mentioned that as well. Any other yeah, views on that? Um, I think it was Runa's uh, contribution to the uh, consultation or the Dogs Trust consul uh, contribution that uh, mentioned extending it to uh, assistance animals. Um, I think we, we fully support that. Um, it's really important to consider um, guide dogs and other assistant animals within this legislation. I think the point was really clearly put in the earlier panel as to how that impacts on each individual if, if an incident occurs um, and the, hu the huge impact of it on an individual animal as well as the person, um, and the implications that they cannot always um, appreciate that there is danger in the area that they're standing with their assistance dog. Um, so I think it really is very important to include this and to increase the scope of, um, of the legislation within the Scottish um, consideration of Finn's law. Okay. Did anyone else? Yeah. Well, our position is that any animal that's made to suffer by humans deserves equal access to justice and therefore the bill will remove that anomaly whereby service animals were not receiving the same justice. Um, we are slightly concerned that the definition is based on the custodian, so police officers or prison officers, so it's a very narrow definition effectively, police dogs and police, ho police horses. I was fully support the view that it should be extended to other assistance dogs who do have to put themselves uh, in, in a position of protecting their owners. Um, it has been said in some quarters that there should be a more severe penalty for attacking a service or assistance dog. On principle, as I say, we believe the suffering of the animal is the same, whether it's a service animal or not. But if that view did persist, it would be possible to consider creating a statutory aggravation so that the penalty for the cruelty to the animal was what it was, but an applicable statutory aggravation such as for a racially motivated crime, that sort of these statutory aggravations do exist. And that would be one way of addressing the, the public disapproval of these attacks on these service animals. Um, I wonder if uh, the test is perhaps something slightly different, in that the likelihood of suffering is increased in service animals compared to animals of the same type that are not service animals. Because we as humans are taking these animals, training these animals, putting these animals in positions of increased danger to them by our choice rather than the choice of the animals. So although the outcomes might be the same, the animals are not volunteers. They're being exposed by human action to the likelihood of increased suffering. And that, that it's that exposure that we are choosing as humans to make that justify our providing that additional protection to these animals. And if the bill said something of that character, it would relieve you of considering whether it's the owner or the person in control of the animal that defines whether the animal should be uh, should be treated in a differential way in terms of sentencing or not. I, I just, listening to what's being said, that occurred to me literally on the hoof, and it's probably an incomplete analysis, but I just wondered how you felt about that. I think your point is that society owes animals that assist us a greater duty of care, and therefore our care for them must be reflected in the available penalties. Um, uh, that's why I suggest possibly it could be considered an aggravated offence. I'm in support of your view on that. I think that's a, a really important point to make. 
Okay, let's move on to talking about wildlife crime. Uh, Claudia, over to you. Thank you, convener. Um, I'd like to ask the, all of the panel, um, as appropriate, about the implications of the proposed increases to wildlife crime offences, some from an animal welfare perspective, to start us off. There's no need to press the button, it's all done for you. Thank you. Um, I, the key word for me is deterrence. Um, and the way in which these crimes are considered by society in general and by our courts and by a sense um, of the way that wildlife is considered by uh, by our society um, and where we get into words like pest um, where particular animals are described in using language which makes it easier and seemingly uh, less thought has to be used about controlling uh, those animals that, that, than others. Um, the League Against Cool Sports has recently been in, is, is moving into an area of looking at uh, the reform of grouse moors in Scotland, and that has taken us into the area of the use of general licences, where it, it seems to us that using fairly low level low levels of uh, corroboration and evidence, vast swathes of animals are killed because they are deemed to be a pest. Um, and the, the word pest is used because they are in danger, they endanger another animal. Um, and very often that other animal is the red grouse. And um, the reason why they want, the, 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 the reason why they, the, the protection of the red grouse is involved is so to make sure there are more red grouse to shoot for, for entertainment. And as you can imagine, an organisation with the name of the League Against Cool Sports um, is, uh, is not best pleased by, by that situation. Um, and what we have is a situation where the success of a grouse shooting estate is the number of grouse that are shot. Uh, that means you need to have more grouse, which means you need to protect those grouse from these so-called pests. Now, the League Against Cool Sports recognises that there are general licences, that that is permissible uh, and under the law, but there are grey areas um, in situations where a professional, whose job it is to make sure there are as many red grouse as possible, um, will look at uh, using methods which go beyond the general licence and become illegal. And um, we welcome any extension of the, of the penalties because of the deterrence fact. And also the vicarious liability side of, uh, of the issue is also very important because we heard earlier on about um, a shop assistant selling alcohol to, to a minor and it's the owner of the, of the, the off-license that can be found guilty of an offence. I think there is a world where uh, the owner of the off license is demanding of the shop assistant that they sell uh, alcohol to minors because they can bring in more money. I don't think that happens. Um, I've seen enough examples of um, successful prosecutions um, of professionals in the countryside whose job it is to make sure there are more grouse um, of being successfully prosecuted. But the the levels of the sanctions I don't think are a deterrent. Um, and in a, in a recent case, which I, w I won't name, um, but I was particularly struck um, by the proceedings and the reaction of the individual uh, and the reaction of the media, because uh, it, was, it became quite a media circus. Uh, a gamekeeper had been uh, prosecuted uh, for a number of wildlife crime offences. There was a, it was the day of the uh, sentencing. There was a, a big media turnout, and the question was, will you go to jail? Because um, the, the range of offences was, was heinous. Uh, it, was, it was broad, it was nasty, uh, it included the, the whole gamut of, of, of different wildlife crimes that, that is possible in that situation. And um, two things happened on that day. First of all, the sheriff made it quite clear that he felt that he should have been able to give a custodial sentence, but felt that he couldn't. 
and that there was a crime and a community order, um, which I think was, uh, didn't reflect the scale of the, cr the crime that was there. Now, and the second thing was there was a, a media hoo-ha outside the court because the media wanted to get a photograph of the individual concerned. Um, the media all went round to the back of the court uh, mistakenly and the, 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 the individual who had just been sentenced came out to the front um, and he danced a jig. He danced a jig of relief and satis satisfaction. Uh, I watched him do it. He uh, and ran down the road and was followed by media um, and the m picture that went in the media was was the individual with two fingers up to the, to the photographers. And I, and I stood there as somebody working in the world of, of uh, animal welfare and wildlife and thinking about what does that say? You know, what does that say about the, um, the levels of acceptance of, of, of deliberate uh, cruelty to animals in the context of making sure that there are more of another animal that can be shot for entertainment. Um, and I, I went away that day thinking, that's not, that's, that's, that's not right. There should be a deterrence. There should be a feeling that if I do something wrong in this way, I will go to jail. And there should be a feeling that if I organize a situation so that my staff make sure that happens, then you should also feel that you're, you're at risk of going to jail. And that's why I, I, can, I can only commend the bill for its, um, for its deterrence impact. I like the flexibility in the bill. I think, I think it recognizes that, you know, that, that we, we heard the word earlier on about negligence. Mm -hmm. Animal welfare can happen by negligence. Now, that's a different world, and that's a world where you are talking about re-education, about knowing about socialization and knowing about the way that we relate to animals. But if it's your job to kill as many animals as possible, then I don't think there's much uh, rehabilita rehabilitation that, that, that can go on. Um, so, as I say, I, I, we welcome the, the, the bill as it, as, it, as, it, as it stands, more or less, um, but, but feel that there are lots of steps that need to be taken in the public domain that gives a greater understanding of the sentience of, of, of all animals and, and why it is that some animals seem to be de de declared to be a pest and are mm. simply eradicated. Mm. Thank you. Uh, anyone else like to come in on Claudia's question? Runa? I probably won't have a position no. on the wildlife no. crime side of things. No. Thank you. Yeah. Anyone else? <coughs> no. Claudia, you've got more questions to ask on this? Or? Well, we've, we've touched on the SSPCA um, issue on, in relation to powers, but in terms of um, the, the fact that... Um, as has been highlighted earlier, and as, as we all know, um, many of these um, crimes and alleged crimes take place in very remote rural areas. I'm wondering about um, any views on um, the possible um, alteration of and increase in powers of the SSPCA um, in relation to wildlife crime, if there's any comments on that. Would anyone like to ask, answer that or give your view? I would just just speak to the, the these crimes happen away from um, from the public eye, and um, again, I, I over the years I've had quite a lot of experience with this. I, I think it's um, I, I think it is difficult for the police to be there. Um, you know, I, it's I, personally as a citizen, I think you know um, personal security, property theft all of those things are, are, are where the priorities for the police lie. I think that they need to do more in this area, but I'm not surprised that they don't have the resources to be out in the middle of the countryside um, looking at issues which they perhaps don't even understand. Um, again, I, I understand that fox hunting isn't a, in the remit of this, this bill, but that's a classic example where it's very difficult to understand what's going on with a fox hunt, and it's very difficult to understand what's going on um, in terms of the sort of evidence that um, would make you suspect that there is wildlife crime going on. I mean, I was shown a, I was shown a, a pole uh, in the middle of the field, which looked like a pole in the middle of a field to me, but then it was pointed out to me that there was a hole drilled in the top and, that where was, and there was a piece of uh, a six-inch nail which was bent down at the bottom right-hand side, 
which um, demonstrated that this was either a, being used as a decoy position or as a pole trap, which is an illegal kind of, kind of uh, trap. Now, I wouldn't have known that, but there are people who, who, who do know these things, and there are not very many police officers who know that. Um, so to make, sh to, to make sure that organisations like uh, SSPCA and RSPB <coughs> and the League have the opportunity to, to be out there and reporting what they do to the police, I think is important. Um, and, we, and we shouldn't be impeded from doing that. OK, Mark? I'm just wondering to what extent the increase in maximum sentencing then changes the, the policing model here. Um, I mean, we have seen the, the trial of the use of special constables, for example, in, in the Cairngorms. And, you know, it was, it was recently reported through a, um, a written parliamentary question that hadn't actually resulted in any, in any convictions over the two years that had been in place. Um, but I'm wondering what, what more can the police do on, on their own? I mean, if this sentencing increase comes in, what does, what does that then do operationally? Does it force a, a change in thinking? Does it force a prioritisation of resources? Or what, what's, what is the model? What is the solution to this? Because it, 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 five years could be a deterrent, but it's only a deterrent if people actually get caught, evidence gets protected, and there's a successful prosecution. So. I, I, could, I, could answer that. I, I think that the, the creation of wildlife crime officers um, is a very, very good thing. However, it's a voluntary role. Um, it's a role which is heaped on top of your other responsibilities. Who wants to be the wildlife crime? So I'll go and I will. Um, and they are, as you, could, as you would imagine, that situation, they, they're variable in their you know, levels of knowledge and um, are also in um, uh, you know, how much time and effort they, they have to do, to do their work. I would much prefer to see a designated wildlife crime officer who was paid to be a wildlife crime officer who could build up a body of knowledge and experience um, to understand that a pole with a hole and a nail is, is, a, is a suspicious I item, um, which you would do as a voluntary wildlife crime officer over a number of years rather than um, you know, in a shorter period of time. Just surrounding this, we're looking at a bill that's going to increase penalties and fines and potential sentences, which you could argue will put more emphasis on the burden of proof when it comes to a case, um, and, and you're, you're exactly right about um, that uh, wildlife crime or being able to identify agriculture, rural uh, commercial animals that are, are suffering and, and so on. So the, the level of expertise is going to have to go up a notch um, and there's going to have to be additional resources or increasing penalties and sentences will be irrelevant if we don't have people on the ground. Do, do you feel that there's enough resources to to actually make any difference if, when this bill is introduced? I think that the level of resource that's applied, it happens in court. Um, I, and and the, the demands on organisations like my own and the police in terms of the levels of proof and the burden of proof are already very high because of the way that um, those uh, who are alleged to be involved are very often represented by people who would never be seen in a sheriff's court um, because of the, um, the resources that are available. Um, again, I, I, I need to, to, to fall back on my experience in the fox hunting sort of situation where um, you know, it's a summary offence, but you're looking at a QC in effect who's, who's representing. So, and the police know that, so you're not talking about uh, the levels of evidence for a summary offence. And I think, it, and this is a personal opinion, that the fiscal also knows that, that the, 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 the case has to be strong, perhaps stronger, than, a, than another summary uh, level because of the amount of attention that will, will be applied. But bring, it, bring in a new bill, I suppose, maybe with maybe completely irrelevant if we don't have police or, uh, or additional agencies there to catch people. It's a bit like, let's reduce the speed limit to 20 miles an hour on rural roads. Well, it's probably pointless because if there's not anybody there to enforce that law, reducing the speed limit is not going to have any effect. So I, I suppose I'm asking whether, are there any concerns that this bill, which would appear in general to be welcomed, will be pointless if we don't have the resources to, to police it effectively. I, I, if I may, I'd, I'd go back to the word deterrence, um, because that deterrent effect, um, I, I think, will, will uh, be effective. 
and going back to the, the speeding, I, I of course always keep to the speed limit, but um, uh, if, if I've seen uh, a police operation with a camera in an area, then maybe I just make sure I'm at much lower than the speed limit for the following weeks. Um, so that, that's why I think it's, we, we welcome the, the, deter the deterrent effect. Um, vicarious liability would extend that, I think, because then it would also mean that others would be concerned as well. We have run out of time. But Stuart has a very short question to round um, us off. I, I just was a bit surprised to hear the suggestion that summary um, jurisdictions have different uh, criminal evidence requirements from solemn. Um, I think the difference is only that in summary the sheriff determines the guilt or innocence and has more limited sentencing powers, uh, whereas in solemn it's the jury determines guilt and innocence and there are higher sentencing. And if, uh, if uh, uh, Mr Marslin knows different, perhaps he can correct me, that the evidence uh, requirements are identical. Yeah, I, 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 I go by personal experience. I've, I've served on uh, three um, juries in the Crown Court, two at the Old Bailey, um, and I've sat for days and days in, in a sheriff's court watching what, what goes on in, the, in those two. And it's a totally personal uh, observation that um, the, uh, the level of the application of the law is, is, is quite different. But so, like I say, it, it's just a personal well, thing. Can, can I just say... I, too, have been in a jury. I have been in the Sheriff Court uh, on, I don't know how many occasions, very large number of occasions, and I've been a member of the Justice Committee in this Parliament and attended 278 Justice Committee meetings. I strongly rebut the idea that the Scottish summary system is in any way inferior to the solemn system. In fact, you're more likely uh, with a professional adjudicant of guilt or innocence, that is the sheriff, to get an outcome that might uh, might be um, less challengeable. Okay, we a, are a constrained into another committee's remit. So, Claudia, you want to finally round this off, and I am going to I have to actually, round up this um, session. Perhaps it's more important that, uh, that Libby came in, but I mean, I, 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 my understanding is, and I am a lay person, as proven earlier in this session, <laughs> um, that, that um, the opportunities for police surveillance are different if it is in the solemn, um, if, it's, if it's a serious crime. That was my understanding. And I think <clears throat> if that is the case, that, that in, in relevance to wildlife crime, that that is um, of particular importance. But I'm prepared to stand corrected. Of course. <laughs> Libby, final word to you before we round off this session. You well, it, it was to say that I do, I do understand the point that Robbie Marsden was making while... Uh, I, I know that Stuart Stevenson is quite correct. The standard of proof remains the same, whether it's a summary or um, a solemn procedure. But I wonder if it's more important to think of the fact that these procedures and the s sentences available at the time of investigation and enforcement would help to concentrate minds more so that the police and the prosecution service, the Crown Office, when they're allocating the resources, would be more inclined to look seriously at an offence that attracts a much higher sentence. And that would apply both to wildlife sentences and the animal welfare sentences. And very briefly on Finlay Carson's point about enforcement, it is true, I think, that local authorities do find enforcement of the Animal Health and Welfare Act quite a burden. There's no resources attached to that. The fixed penalty notices and the uh, removal, disposal of animals, I think, will relieve their mm. burden a lot. And I think we all accept that the overall effect of this bill will be to raise the level of enforcement. OK, that's a good note to end on. Um, that concludes the committee's business in public today. At its next meeting on the 10th of December, the committee expects here further evidence on the Animals and Wildlife Protections, Penalties and Powers Scotland Bill. We'll now move into private session and I ask that the public gallery be cleared as the public part of the meeting is now closed and I'll suspend briefly to allow our witnesses to leave. Thank you. <laughs>